Hi, welcome to Ethereal Mechanics video number 20. This is Ether video number 2, uh, where this is uh, we're going to use reciprocal thinking to start the development of the new Ether model. So this is new Ether model part 1. Uh, this is for general audience. This is very simple logic. There's no math here. Um, and uh, my name is Robert Distinti. I'm an electrical engineer. If you want to see what Ethereal Mechanics is all about, uh, there's video number 1, which is an intro. Okay, so what are we going to do in this video? We're going to demonstrate reciprocal thinking and show how humans always seem to get science backwards before they get it right. And show that the original idea was sound, it was just not well thought out. And we're going to discuss the Michael Samorley experiment with respect to the new ether model. Now this is only the beginning. Okay, the ether conveys all known forces in the universe. It will take many videos to completely describe all the aspects of the new ether model in detail. This first set of videos is only enough to cover ether with regard to cosmology, gravity, inertia, etc. So we can get into Distinti's universe before we then finally get into the hardcore electromagnetic aspects of the ether. So what's reciprocal thinking? Well, when you think you understand something, you should pause and ask yourself the following. Could it be the other way around? Does A cause B or does B cause A? Could it be a combination? In other words, A causes B, which then causes more A, a vicious cycle. Or could it be caused, cased, caused by something else? Sorry. In other words, uh, well, we'll cover examples. For example, if a ship's are passing, passing you, are you moving? Or is the other ship moving? Or are both ships have some sort of velocity and the apparent difference in the motion? Or is the Earth shrinking? And that's why it looks like the ships are approaching. Okay, don't ever underestimate thinking outside of the box. No matter how strange or crazy it is, uh, it keeps your mind open to alternate ideas. Here's an example to global warming. Does increased carbon dioxide levels cause the Earth to get warmer? Or do carbon dioxide levels increase because the Earth is warming? This makes more sense to me, and I'll tell you why. Because back during the Ice Age, something had to produce carbon dioxide to start the Ice Age to thaw where if you do it the other way around, as the ice started receding, there was more open ocean and more open grasslands for creatures to expand and grow into, and therefore the respiration gases increased. So it could be the other way around. I think it's this way. Or maybe the Earth's climate is exasperated by increased carbon dioxide. In other words, something else caused the increase, but maybe the carbon dioxide is exasperating the situation. Okay, that's a little of both, a vicious cycle. Or is global warming caused by an increase in solar output? Something completely different. So that's, I'm not trying to be, uh, get into the global warming politics. I'm just trying to show you the way that you have to think about everything. Which one of these is the actual solution? I, I, everyone's got their opinion. Just showing you how to be complete in your thinking. But we have to remember, Mother Nature is good at making humans look like fools. And my logo here is an effigy of Mother Nature. It's... It's actually an art school copy of a Picasso. It was done by a woman named Julie. Um, interesting history of that painting. Oh, and I like the painting better than the Picasso because the woman looks more stately and proud and elegant. <clears throat> so, let's give another example. Early man observed that stars moved across the night sky. Because he did not feel any motion, he concluded that the stars revolve around the earth. And then, you know what, this is the first explanation we had, and you know what, we clung to it tenaciously. But eventually it was found to be backwards because, say, a reciprocal thinker named Galileo, and it had Copernicus had something to do with it, came in and pretty much said, in no uncertain terms, you guys are idiots, you have it backwards. Its stars are stationary, it's the Earth that spins. But then, as we learn more, we realize that everything's in motion. Nothing is stationary. The solution is a combination of all motion, stars and Earth. However, the perceived motion of the stars is substantially due to the spin of the Earth. And you see, as we learn more, we learn that even Galileo wasn't 100% correct. So what can we learn from this example? We know that their first model was horribly long. Is there some property of the first model that we can use to leverage to help us identify bad models as we go forward? Eh, maybe. Let's see the next page. One thing that we would have noticed from the old Earth-centric model is later on in, 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 as we evolve, we would have noticed that there's different distances between all the stars. And in order for the stars to keep up the same angular 
position in the sky with each other, farther stars would have to travel at a higher speed. And eventually, as you go far and farther away, stars would be traveling faster than the speed of light. Okay, so now we have a distance speed relationship. Okay, so now a rule of acquisition 21, the speed distance tell. If you have a model theory or, or model theory or observation where the more distant objects move faster, even to the point of exceeding the speed of light, then you should consider that something might be wrong. <laughs> Hubble, <laughs> Hubble's law. <laughs> uh, another question: If the stars were in motion, then what caused them all to have the same path around the sun? I mean, should it not be sensible to have at least one counter-orbiting star? You know, I mean, why are they all working the same way? So, rule of acquisition number 22, the common behavior tell. If everything is or appears to be acting alike, then there must be a reason or cause. Like, why do the stars move in the same direction around the Earth? Why do toilets flush in the same direction on a per-hemisphere basis? Why do the planets orbit the same direction around the Sun? Why do stars orbit the same direction around the galactic core? And another one that keeps me up at night with regard to rule of acquisition number 22, why are all the molecules constructed such that electrons orbit a nucleus made of protons? Why can't protons circle around a nucleus made of electrons? This is a case of reciprocal thinking. Or is, is it happening? Is there a combination of both? So let's apply reciprocal thinking. In the next slide, we're going to apply reciprocal thinking to common scientific principles. Uh, from this exercise, we're going to learn a great bulk of scientific knowledge might actually be backwards, and a new ether model will surface. So let's look at Einstein's principle of equivalence, one of my favorite things in the universe. Okay, Einstein stated that if you're in a spaceship and you're being accelerated at 9.8 meters per second, per second, that you're going to be held against the bottom of the spaceship. And you will not, inside your spaceship, you will not be able to tell the difference if you were, that spaceship were just sitting on the Earth. You cannot tell the difference from inside your spaceship, whether you're on the Earth or accelerating through space at 9.8 times meters per second. So if we do reciprocal thinking then, we say then, well, if accelerating through space is the same, is similar to standing on the Earth, then why can't standing on the Earth be the same as accelerating through space? Reciprocal thinking. Okay. So maybe space, since you're accelerating through space, maybe space is being accelerated toward the Earth. Huh. Well, Let's look at this in more detail. Let's look at some experiments. This is a busy slide, so I'm going to block it off to make it easier to explain. Let's have two experiments involving brass cannonballs. Brass cannonballs are my favorite thing. Okay, we're going to, in space, we're going to put two brass cannonballs. And at the beginning of the experiment, we're going to, we're going to accelerate this brass cannonball by 9.8 meters per second per second squared, such that they're going to be closing at each other by 9.8 meters, closing at an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. And what we're going to do then is we're going to attach some electrical engineering equipment to the cannonballs called accelerometers. And those accelerometers, when the experiment starts, this cannonball is going to show an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared in this direction. This cannonball is going to show an acceleration of nothing. Okay, now our scientific theory says is agreement, is in agreement with this uh, with the electrical engineering instrumentation. So let's go now to the Earth. On the Earth, we're going to have two identical cannonballs, one sitting on the Earth, and one at, a, at the beginning of the experiment is going to be dropped from a certain height, such that, um, according to theory, it's going to accelerate at 9.8 meters per second down to hit the other cannonball, which is going to be stationary, according to 300-year-old theory. Right, well, but then if we attach instruments to these cannonballs, we find that the accelerometer on the one on the Earth shows that this cannonball is the one that's accelerating, and it's accelerating up, where this cannonball shows no acceleration. So our instruments disagree with our theory, but the instruments agree with Einstein's principle, which says that you cannot tell the difference. So this cannonball is stationary, and this cannonball is stationary. This cannonball is accelerating, and this cannonball is accelerating. Theory is wrong.
Okay, so if this cannonball is accelerating through space, then this cannonball has to be accelerating through space. The acceleration relative to space is the cause of inertia. And we're going to show that the, perhaps the Earth consumes space. Okay, since volume can't be consumed, space must be filled with a substance that is being consumed. For lack of anything more appropriate, the term ether, I chose the term ether to name this material. This hole is the origin of ethereal mechanics. Okay, so let's recap. Gravity is inertia. If acceleration of a body relative to the ether causes the inertial force, and if the earth consumes ether, causing ether to accelerate earthward, then the inertial force caused by, as the ether accelerates through us, is the force of gravity which holds us to the earth. It's also the force of inertia which holds us to the bottom of the spaceship. Okay, but we have to remember something. Equivalent is not the same. In relativity, Einstein says that gravity and inertia are equivalent. That's like saying 2 plus 2 is equivalent to 4. Okay, in ethereal mechanics, we say gravity is inertia. 2 plus 2 is 4. Inertia is the new induction model shown previously. Uh, see video number 15 for a simple demo near the end. Uh, but we're going to derive the inertia and gravity and all that more rigorously after we cover the uh, in the electromagnetic part of ethereal mechanics. All right. The other thing, since the accelerometers only point perpendicular to the surface of the Earth, we conclude that the tangential acceleration of the ether is zero with respect to the Earth. Therefore, so should be the tangential velocity of the ether. Okay. Thus, ether flow in the ether flows into the Earth in a spiral direction. Uh, Terence and Philip, this is the only bright spot in the house because it's a cloudy day. So, expect Terence and Philip to come and help out. So, the ether flows in in a spiral fashion, as such that the velocity near the surface matches the velocity of the Earth. Okay, And that would explain, since there is no tangent velocity of the ether relative to the surface of the Earth, the Michelson movement should obtain a null result. But then this would suggest that there's such a thing as ether dragging. But ether dragging was disproved through various experiments in the past. Um, but this solution, too, requires a reciprocal thinking. Does the Earth drag the ether, or does the ether drag the Earth? Well, ask yourself, was the falling cannonball dragging the ether, or was it being dragged by the ether, or both, or neither? We're going to talk about this in video number 22. Big Bang Theory. Let's apply reciprocal thinking to the Big Bang Theory. After the Big Bang, they say subatomic particles condensed into free hydrogen. And through gravity and fusion, hydrogen is condensing to all heavier known elements. The end of the universe is supposedly going to be a big crunch. But this kind of is in violation of thermodynamics, which is elements, you know, because if elements are going from lighter elements to heavier elements, then energy states are going from lower to higher. That's it. That goes in opposite with thermodynamics, my understanding anyway. And that means if we're going to more ordered elements, that means our entropy is going from higher to lower, which is wrong. It means we're going to a more ordered universe. Okay, according to thermodynamics, the universe should be going to lower and lower states, higher and higher entropy. We are going backwards. Okay, so we need some reciprocal thinking. Video 21, we're going to show you that the Big Bang Theory is wrong. The universe is going the other way. We're going from higher energy states, denser matter, and the universe is evaporating into lighter and lighter matter. Hydrogen is going to, and subatomic part is going to be the end of the universe, not the beginning. The trouble with Hubble. Hubble's law states that the further away galaxies are, the faster they are traveling, even exceeding the speed of light. Whoa! Rule of acquisition 21 alert. Okay, remember rule of acquisition number 21. Oh, I can't find it. Where the mass or the speed velocity relationship. Oh, where the heck is it? The speed distance tell. If you have a model of theory or observation where the more distant objects move faster, even the point of speed and speed of light, then you should consider that something might be wrong. Okay, we're going to get into this in video 21, or sorry, 23. Um, interesting. So mankind seems to get stuff backwards first. Reciprocal thinking technique could help short circuit some of the nonsense. Uh, from the reciprocal thinking, we developed a new ether model. We find that inertia is caused by the acceleration of an object relative to the ether. 
We also find that the gravity is inertia because massive bodies consume the ether. Why do massive bodies consume the ether? You got to see the next video. Uh, the Michelson Morley experiments are, is consistent with the new ether model, and so will ether dragging and the stellar anomaly. Uh, video 22 and 28. Now these video numbers might change depending on how the production comes out. What's the downside of reciprocal thinking? Well, I've developed a speech problem. Like I say, sometimes get my words reversed. I say a walk to snow in the school, or I say lisdexia instead of dyslexia, or you know, instead of saying you don't know what you're talking about, I might say you, you know what you don't talk about. So it gets, I end up crunching up and confusing my words. Because uh, I do reciprocal thinking all the time. It's part of my job as being an electrical engineer because everything in electronics is reciprocal. So what's next? Video number 21 is the most important 15 minutes in the history of science. We're going to show you, I believe we're going to show you, and I say we, it's me. I always talk in terms of we. It sounds like I'm a big company. It's just me. Uh, then we're going to get into ether dragging. I might combine stellar aberration into this. I don't know yet. I left it down here so I could put it in there. Uh, but this is uh, Distinti's universe. Uh, that's fun stuff. There's no very little math, uh, but I'm going to show you a completely different universe than what you're thinking about. If the ether is right, then we have most of the stuff about stars, galaxies, and universe, planetary orbits. It's complete nonsense of what we. Uh, thank you for donating. Don't miss the next video. Thank you.